Generally speaking, bitter flavors aren't what most people gravitate towards. They tend to be an acquired taste. For instance, no one starts liking coffee. So don't worry if Amaro isn't your favorite thing to drink. But if you are interested in learning to like them, I have a few suggestions to help you find some styles and situations to help you along. Amaro, which just means bitter in Italian, refer to the collective category of bittersweet liqueurs traditionally served before dinner to whet your appetite, and after dinner to help you digest. You see, long ago, tasting something bitter was an indication of poisonous, inedible plants, or of rotting food, and humans evolved to recognize that. Our bodies register these flavors as possible threats and engage the digestive system. Basically, if you have an empty stomach, it makes you feel hungry. If you just finished a big meal, it helps you digest. Outside of the broader categories of aperitif and digestif, amari can be broken into a loosely defined set of categories. Unfortunately, there are no real rules governing these, and they don't really help when trying to find an Amaro that you might enjoy. Many Italian Amaro makers are actively lobbying for a defined categorization, but it's unlikely they will ever get one, because each Amaro is so different, and they are popping up all over the world. For now, as long as it's a bittersweet liqueur, it pretty much qualifies as an Amaro. Come on! Ah! That's a pretty loose definition. Perhaps this increased production is muddying the waters a bit, but then again, the history of Amari is more about tradition and lore rather than strict rules and regulations. Ingredients and recipes tend to be closely guarded secrets. When the moon hits your eye like that pie in the sky, that's Amaro. That's Amaro. Amaro makers boast about the number of herbs that go into their products, but when it comes time to name them, they're famously tight-lipped. What can be said for certain is that most Amaro follow a four-prong construction. Some are made with a neutral spirit base, such as beet molasses, while others use anything from a grappa base to whiskey, depending on the desired profile. Many producers use gentian flowers, or roots, as the bittering agent, but some use bark, like wormwood. I did say it's a bitter sweet liqueur. No matter how many bitter ingredients are added, there will always be a balancing note of sweetness. This can come in the form of sugar, molasses, or honey, to name a few. This is where producers really go nuts. Amari of all styles are made by macerating what's basically a potpourri sachet's worth of spices, herbs, bark, and citrus peel in the spirit base. To help with this, I've asked my good friend and bitters expert, Souther Teague, back to help walk us through some of the more recognizable flavors on the market now, and hopefully help us with some recommendations. Ah, hi Souther. Thanks for coming back to help us out again. I'm always happy to help, Bennett. You know I'm a big fan of Amari. <laughs> well, that's an understatement. Well, how about we start with this? What's an easy way for us to tell the difference between Amaro and the bitters we talked about last time? I think of it like this. Bitters are the seasoning to the soup that Amari and everything else on the back bar make up. Thanks for clearing that up. So what kind of flavors should a beginner be looking out for if they want to learn to love Amaro? A common Amaro flavor is citrus. Like in this Montenegro, it's got bitter orange and orange blossom with hints of vanilla. They've been making this the same way every day since 1885. Citrus is a great place to start. What's the next step we should take? 
I highly recommend trying Maletti Amaro. It's a cola nut Amaro, made from the same ingredient that flavors your favorite Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola. Uh, packs a wallop at 32% ABV. Try adding some of this to seltzer and your favorite spirit for a something in Coke. What's something we should look out for if we want to, say, be adventurous without getting scared away? Try an Alpine Amaro like Braulio. It uses gentian as the bittering agent along with juniper, citrus, and peppermint for flavor. Um, it's kind of like an after-dinner mint. Ooh, good. What about a curveball? How about something a little closer to home? Here's a great example of domestic Amaro from the heartland of Kansas City, Jay Rieger's Cafe Amaro. Uh, it's made with single origin coffee, blended with botanicals like cardamom and spearmint, uh, and then rested in Jay Rieger's own whiskey barrels. It's delightful. These are such great examples. Thank you, Souther. I really appreciate you taking the time to help us all out. It's always a pleasure to be here, friend. I'd also like to add that a couple of great resources for information about Amaro can be found in Brad Thomas Parsons' book, Amaro, and my book, I'm Just Here for the Drinks, has an entire chapter dedicated to the topic. Thanks again for having me on, Bennett. That was great. Like Souther showed us, there are so many familiar flavors in Amaro, and so many ways to enjoy drinking them. How you drink, though, is entirely up to you. Neat, chilled, on the rocks, with or without a slice of citrus or a twist. But you can try all that on your own time. I want to make a cocktail. And I'm going to make a cocktail called The Waterproof Watch from Souther's book, I'm Just Here for the Drinks. Start with two dashes of Dale DeGroff's Pimento Bitters. You remember those? Three quarters of an ounce of Aperol. Three quarters of an ounce of Amaro Montenegro. And one and a half ounces of a London Dry Gin. I'm using Ford's. Stir over plenty of ice and strain into a rocks glass over fresh ice. Look at that. Then garnish with an orange twist. I hope that you take the time to find an Amaro that you can enjoy, because there are so many wonderful examples out there. I had so much fun learning about them over the years, and I know that you will too. Take care now.